Does the LDS Church really hold Paul's teachings in high esteem? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. Appreciate you joining us. And today we have Alex Alexander. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming and all the way from Cedar City. Yes. Appreciate you coming up and sharing. And it's it's a fascinating story. Uh, You weren't born in the church, is that right? Yes, I was not born in the church. um, My grandfather was actually a non-denominational minister. And he was. Yes, he was. And where was this at? He had a church called Bible Christian Church in Lee Grand, California. Lee Grand, California. And where I, were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C., actually, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. My dad was a Vietnam vet. Oh, yeah. And we uh, came back to California shortly after I was born. My dad got out of the military. Yeah. And uh, my parents divorced when I was very young. I was oh. around four years old when they divorced. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were kind of doomed from the start to begin with. My, <laughs> my mother um, was a free spirit. Oh. And my father was a pastor's son. Oh. And it just didn't mesh very well. So <laughs> okay. I'm, I, honestly, I'm kind of glad they divorced because living with them together probably would not have been very fun. So. Wouldn't, have been, wouldn't have been. And brothers and sisters? Did you I have, have a f- full brother and a half brother and a couple step brothers. Oh, okay. So I have a really mixed up family. Okay. And so were you raised Christian then, pretty much? To a, an extent. Yeah. I mean, every other weekend I would go to church when I visited my father. My custodial mother was not a Christian. Oh, and okay. In fact, she was pretty far from it, bless her heart. Um, but yeah, but you, so you went every other. I went to vacation Bible school oh, from an did. early age, okay. um, and I had, a, like I said, a pastor grandfather who taught me the Bible, mm. and I'd listen to him all the time. But you know, when I became a teenager, I loved the freedom of my mother's way more. Yeah. To be honest with you, and that's pretty typical, like or not well, so typical. But I, I know that's an easy. Easy draw, isn't it? To, it is. To kind of, it's, if, you, if you have that choice. It's not very worthwhile when you look back <laughs> on it, but it, it's easy at, at the time. So what happens uh, in your life? I know you get through school. Do you, are you still in California at this point? And, uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I, I moved to St. George when I was uh, 20 years old. Oh. And I took uh, three missionary lessons in Stockton. I was uh, looking for a oh, church. Oh, Stockton, California? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I was looking for a different church. At that point, I went to Pentecostal church when I was 17, met an amazing youth pastor who I actually reconnected with when I became born again. And, you know, he was the only good thing about that church, honestly, because the, there's a lot of backbiting. And the, And this was in Stockton? Yes, sir, it was. So you, so in St. George, you take more lessons? Or? I did. I met, a, I met a man on a ward mission night, and I told him I took three missionary lessons in California. And that's like throwing a stake to hungry pit bulls. <laughs> um, and... Bless his heart, great man. He passed away in 2016 at 85 mm-hmm. years old. But his wife mm-hmm. and him invited me into their home and part of their family. Yeah. And they had nine kids, and uh, oh, the youngest really? was actually a year older than me. And, and they. And you took lessons there, or? I did. Oh, you I took did. the missionary lessons, uh, the rest of them, and then I got baptized December 15th of 1996. Okay. What drew you to the church? Well, honestly, I. I'm one of those people that's kind of alone in a crowded room. I've always, even if I have a lot of friends, and I did have quite a few friends growing up, I always still felt like I was lonely and missing something. Mm. And the LDS Church offered a brotherhood that I was kind of missing. And I I was intrigued by their view on families. Yeah. Because, you know, I I I didn't enjoy that view, honestly. Uh, because sure, yeah, and then you learned about the church's uh, families are forever kind of thing. Yes. Yes. And it was, it was, uh, at first, it was, some of it was a hard pill to swallow, and there was things I questioned over the years. But I was also willing and able to put those things away and just say, "Okay, it's a peculiar people," like they always told me. Yeah. So I didn't realize how peculiar it really was till I went to the temple, though. What What do you kind of recall before your age twenty? What your feelings about Jesus were and grace and works? Did you kind of understand I was pretty that angry, concept? Angry with God, honestly, for quite a few years, oh, yeah. and. People didn't treat my father very well in the church, even though my grandfather was the pastor. Uh-huh. My father was a Vietnam vet. He was mentally ill. Uh-huh. He was in and out of treatment centers my whole life. And he was time, also a huh? smoker. Yeah. And he was divorced, uh-huh. which was a big no-no in the church I grew up in. Several strikes. Huh? Yes. Yeah. And people, you know, I remember one time um, this little girl fell down. I went to help her up, and I was like 10 years old. And mom's like, don't touch her. You know, and I'm like, what's the matter with you? 
And they didn't like my father, so they always thought I was going to be a little heathen or hooligan, which I, I guess I did turn out to be that way for a while. But <laughs> Fulfilled the prophecy there. Yes. Huh? Well, so, um, but Jesus was not all that important then? or I not mean, really. was he? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I knew there was a God. Yeah. I knew about Jesus. And you'd read some of the Bible, I guess. But I was, yeah, I've read a lot of the Bible. Bible I knew I was, Bible school. I, I always say I was bashed in the head with the Bible my whole life growing up. But <laughs> um, I was still very bitter. Yeah. against anything. Of so what did pain. you think about Joseph Smith seeing God and Jesus in the grove when you heard that story? Well, I had some doubts. It sounded a little weird to me, but yeah. I don't know. It was it was weird. I, I did have kind of a spiritual experience at one point where I thought, okay, this this might have happened. A burning in the bosom or something? Yeah, burning in the bosom. Yeah. I prayed about it, but you know, honestly, I stayed in because of my family. You can ask my wife, I and mean, we, we I questioned over the years. And I questioned the Apostle Paul quite a bit to leadership, oh. the words of Paul, because like I told you, the, Paul, Paul's words don't match up with Mormonism at all. So in other words, what? Well, you know, in Galatians <laughs> it talks about, uh, basically it talks about Joseph Smith with fire another angel, or an comes, angel comes. Preach you know. any, preaches any other gospel. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the big things, but it also talks about grace. And so you're, I, you're not saved by your works. Your works are filthy rags to God. So I started out by saying, do the LDS hold Paul in high esteem? And when I reflect back on my time in the church, about the only thing I really recall is his conversion. I didn't really know his teachings. I didn't know anything about his other journeys and what he, what he taught. But you were sharing this with leadership, and what yes. did they say? Well, I was called on the carpet by a bishop who said, we hold Paul in great esteem. And I was in elders' quorum telling people, hey, if Paul's right, we're wrong. Hate to tell you guys, <laughs> and that's why if I. Paul's and right, I, we're wrong. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I was, I was telling them about you know I was the Bible being translated correctly. Yeah, it's like you shouldn't listen to the words of Paul at all. I was trying to downplay because I knew Paul was correct, deep oh. down. Oh, you did. I really did. I really, and I was feeling convicted, which is why I was saying all this stuff. And then I got called on the carpet, and the bishop says, "We hold him in great esteem. You need to watch what you say." It's like I'm not going to watch what I say. I've never once watched what I said my whole life. I'm not about to now. And, you know, if they want to excommunicate me, fine, whatever. I, that's the way I felt about it, honestly. And I was... Amazing. Well, we jumped ahead just a little bit, I guess. Uh, you're converted to the church, and this is before you've met your wife? Yes. Okay. And this is in St. George. And w did you meet her soon after this? or what, what happened We met there? in 1998. Well, the first time in 1997 at a fireside. Okay. through a mutual friend, okay. and then about six months later, that same friend asked if uh, I want to go dancing with her, and then my, and said, my friend Sherry's going to be there. It's oh. like, oh, okay. So and I she's good, active here. LDS. Yes. Okay. And it was, uh, she, she turned around in the car, and I was hooked. <laughs> and Funny we how were engaged happens. a week after, and married three months after that, so. Wow. And we just celebrated 21 years last June. Well, congratulations. Well, That's no one thought we'd be together even a year. You do end up getting sealed in the temple. We did. Yeah. We, uh, was that in St. George? Yes, it was. Okay. We waited a year. Yeah. And much to the chagrin of a lot of people we knew. <laughs> but it wasn't the, it was the right thing for us to do. And we actually took our daughter with us. She was six months old at the time. We had a baby real quick oh. after marriage. Yeah, okay. I mean, literally a wedding night surprise, according <laughs> to the doctor. But she's 20 now. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of the temple when you went through it? I thought it was very strange. Did you? I expected more. I expected more learning. I expected, I didn't expect anything I saw. <laughs> Wasn't what, and they don't talk about it at all outside no. of the church. So you really don't know what you're, what you're going to be uh, seeing. And, no, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect and I didn't like what I saw. But as like, again, I put it away, peculiar people. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of a badge of honor, isn't it, to, to be a peculiar and unique people. And I'm one of the most peculiar you're ever going to meet, so that's okay. <laughs> okay, so go, life goes on. You become, you're a Sunday school teacher, I guess, elders quorum. Uh, Taught in elders quorum pre, quite a bit. Did you? Most of my callings were actually in the primary. Yeah. We always joke that and I needed scout to. Master, scout I guess master. Scout master, yes. Too, and... I always joke that they, uh, my wife too, that we needed to learn what they learned in primary. Yeah. I never went to primary growing up, so oh. I always joked about that. But we, for some reason, we always taught the eight-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do a lot of studying? I mean, you read the Book of Mormon, probably. Did you do a lot of other reading? And I read the Book of Mormon straight through one time. Yeah. And I've touched on it over the years, but I mostly studied prayed, the Bible. You prayed about it, and did you? Yeah. I, 
I got mixed answers, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I had doubts, a lot of doubts over the years. Uh, but I, I really... Were they, were they doubts about the doctrine or the... I mean, did you know any of the history or was it just theology or what? Mostly theology. Yeah. I didn't know about the history, actually. I, I, was, I was born again in July of 2018. And I didn't find out about the Gospel Topic essays until September, <laughs> oh. oddly enough. And I started reading about those. And then I found out a lot of church history. But, you know, I'll back up a little bit. January 2018, I was working one night, and I stopped in St. George, my father-in-law's house, and I always turned to him for spiritual advice. And I told him, I said, look, I'm going through the motions here. I don't feel it. I don't feel the spirit anymore. And he said, it's okay to go through the motions because that's how you learn. Mm. And he's a very good man. I, yeah. I admire him a lot. Yeah. And he told me what, of course, what they're going to say. Read the Book of Mormon and pray. I did read the Book of Mormon, and I found out that a lot of the Book of Mormon did not match up with even the doctrine of the church. There was a lot of things. They talked about hell a lot. And the thing about polygamy, I can't remember where it is, but... And talk, Jacob. Yeah, and Jacob know. talked about uh, polygamy is just an abomination. Right. And that they would tell me, well, sometimes you've got to break God's laws to fulfill... What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. You're never supposed to break God's laws. So that was a thing, and they talked about the, the triune God, too, in the Book of Mormon. And so I was looking at that and going, okay, well, I was kind of happy about it. And then I prayed, and I, I was getting different answers. God was pushing me somewhere else. Hmm. And, you know, when the church came out with, against Proposition 2, our daughter had seizures, so I was pretty upset about the way they handled that it. That was the uh, medical marijuana. Yes. And, and it was, would have helped your children? It would help my daughter a lot. Daughter. And she has a seizure. The next day I get an email from the church saying, we strongly encourage you to vote against Proposition 2. <laughs> I was angry because... Because yeah, you thought this was something that could help. And, yeah, and I kind of understood a little bit. I mean, they don't want, you know, they don't want recreational marijuana. Right. That's fine. But then, you know, the opposition against the bill were telling blatant lies, and the church was joining these people. It's like, well, okay, why would... God inspired people to join liars. And that, that was really irritating to Not me. Not being real truthful, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I, I really don't like marijuana, but <laughs> I, it does help medically. But you kept going to church, you're trying to be faithful, and uh, I well, know you. I went inactive for a while. Um, we had periods of inactivity. Uh, With your wife? Yes. Okay. Back in 2016, my sister in law went through the temple, and we were inactive at that point. And but she was going to go through the temple. My mother-in-law told us, "Well, I don't want empty seats." So, and she has Down syndrome, and so, we love her to death. She's the sweetest girl in the world. We wanted to be there for so her. You got ready, and we did. We started attending again, started paying our tithing, and <laughs> we got our recommends. Oh, okay, good for you. And then my son was about to go on a mission shortly. After, well, a couple years later, like 2018, he was he turned 18 years old. And you got ready to go to the temple again. Did well, you, or, yeah, I did, and I ordained him an elder. I got active, and yeah. I, you know, paid my tithing, did what I was supposed to do. Yeah, and then he announced that he wasn't going on a mission, and I announced I was not going to be going to church anymore because I was going for other people, and I was doing things for other people. Well, as you look back on those, how long were you then in the church? Twenty years. Twenty-two years. Twenty-two years. What I mean, you, it sounds like you struggled with activity and and. Uh, what was it that, was it just that it didn't fit right? It didn't seem to be quite right, but you weren't sure what it was? or God was calling me elsewhere. Yeah. I, I really feel it. And he was working on me for many years. And I was, I was very bitter against Protestantism as a whole growing up. Really? And I wanted nothing to do with that. And one of the worst things for me, honestly, would to be to admit to my family that they were right. Oh. And although I, I, I'm, I'm pretty close with most of my aunts and uncles. Now, they're still all Christian. Yes. So you didn't want to admit to them that, well, of course, when you were going through Mormonism, you had made that decision, and they weren't happy about that, I no, guess. They yeah. But they never really turned their back on me. Yeah. I, I assume they did. <laughs> but when I would go visit or whatever, they were always you know, very open and very welcome, welcoming towards me. And when I told my grandmother passed away in October, and she was the pastor's wife. And when I just went, last 2018, yes, okay. 2018, and my aunt and I talked in the funeral home, and I told her I had accepted Jesus again, and she she was very happy. She wasn't judgmental. She wasn't like I told you so. <laughs> you know, I really she was just happy for you. Huh? Yeah, she was. Now this happened just a few months earlier. So tell us about how how you came to 
uh, accept Christ, as we say. And well, I've been questioning for a while, as I told you. Yeah. And I was uh, working a route job in St. George. And I was driving my work truck, listening to Sirius XM, and something told me, you need to listen to some Christian stuff. There's Christian channels. And I didn't know that because I listened to my metal or heavy metal or whatever. <laughs> so I turned it to, you know, the Joel Osteen channel. Oh. And at the end of his, his sermon, he gave an opportunity to accept Christ. And something told me, take him up on that offer. Let's see, see what Really? Happened. Yes. Had you ever done that before? When I was younger. Oh, you know, you know, oh was, what, uh, before 20, yeah. Yes. And I did. And I prayed with the prayer with him, and I felt the Spirit automatically. And then something came back and told me about my, what my grandfather told me. Yeah, what was that? He told me I'd always, he'd always told me I'd be a pastor one day. And this is when I was going through my drugs and alcohol as a teenager. <laughs> and I laughed at him. It's like, yeah, I'm, and he'd passed away actually when I was 15. Oh. But he t it told me before that. That he would. Yeah. To someday be a pastor. He did. And then in, being in the Mormon church, that, that would probably, I'm sure you thought about that. What? I always did. Yeah. And my, did you think, my well, wife that's never, tell you over the that's years. That's never going to happen. I told, I, I wanted to be. I told her, I says, I think that. I need to be a pastor at some point. She looked at me funny. When I, when I did say the prayer, I went home and told her. I said, you know, I, I said this prayer, and it's going to be hard for you to understand this, but I'm a born-again Christian now. I am not a Mormon anymore. Just like that. Yeah. And she <laughs> didn't know did, how to accept what it. What did she say? Well, she just... She, one Mormons don't she, really understand that whole business about really being born again. We know what Nicodemus says to Jesus or asks him, but uh, we don't really understand that concept. And they don't understand the personal relationship because they don't think that's enough. No. And no. when I told her this, one of the first reactions she had was, she says, I can never go to a church that doesn't believe in eternal families. Mm. This is the way she was taught growing up. I do understand. Sure, I understand. And, but the eternal family thing I've come to realize is a means of control as well. I'm not trying to bash or be right, mean, but it's right. true. Yeah. And they're taught from an early age in primary. I mean, there's a lot of indoctrination going on. I was Well, the temple and, like you say, the families and every It's all indoctrination, really. Yes, the song, the mantra, follow the prophet. <laughs> yeah. you know, over and over again, follow the prophet. Yeah. Tell these little kids. And <laughs> so it just it pounds it into their head. And the families can be together forever if we follow God's yeah. plan. So people automatically fear not being with their family. Yeah. And it is a means of control, I found out. I've studied cults, a lot of cults, Jim Jones, David Koresh. I never looked at Mormonism quite like that as a cult. Right. But over the years, I've seen different cultish, you know, just because they're not, you know, hurting right. people or, you know, taking advantage of people in certain yeah. in ways that David Koresh and Jim Jones did, right. doesn't make them any less of a cult. So what, what more did your wife think or say, or what, how did that conflict? Do you quit going to church then? I or? did. Yeah. And she, she went sometimes, but she wasn't very active at that point either. Um, our, we have two daughters that have special needs, and they weren't always well received in our, the ward we were in. Yeah, that's hard, isn't either. it? Either. Yeah. So it's kind of hard for her to go. But she just questioned the doctrine, and you know, there's still questions she has yeah. about the Trinity. Yeah. And it's understandable. Oh, it's tough. It is. Yeah, I have to admit, it's tough. And she, I, t I told her recently, well, you know what? You believe Jesus died for your sins. That's what matters at this point. Let's just work with that. Yeah. And then we'll, the rest of it will work itself out, the nature of God. Well, that's, a, that's the foundation, I mean, yes. to be resting on the Because without Christ dying for our sins, it would all be a moot point anyway. That's right. Yeah. I want to back up just a little bit. You mentioned something about reading through the Book of Mormon, realizing that, that uh, it doesn't really mesh up with uh, Mormon doctrine a little bit. What I found interesting after I left and never thought about it before, but a lot of Mormon doctrine isn't even in the Book of Mormon. And yet Joseph Smith said that it was the most correct book, and I think it's the most corrected book probably. But, <laughs> but uh, it didn't have any of the Families Are Forever or Temple and um, that we can become gods or that, you know, all the different teachings of the church, they're just not in the Book of Mormon. Did you? find that at all? Or yes, it I just did. struck me anyway. I found a lot of it. Yeah. A lot of the same things you're talking about. Yeah. And just their view on God itself yeah. is different in the Book of Mormon than it is in the LDS Church. And oh, so now their view I'm, on hell as well. I mean, Yeah, th there is a lot of hell. <laughs> Jesus mentioned hell in the Bible more than he did heaven. <laughs> yeah. So I think that hell is a real place. Pay attention to that. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, back to Paul then. Have you done some reading? I guess you've obviously read the New Testament more now. And I read uh, Paul all the time. Yeah. Isn't and that amazing? I always knew he was correct. That's I was convicted. That's why I always, you know, try to counter Paul with people. Yeah. And to, for me to stay in the church, I had to justify the beliefs. And I, I did for many years. Yeah. And I, I had to bash to Paul to be able to justify. Yeah. I had to say, well, Paul, you know, it says in the Bible that the tribe of Benjamin shall be as ravenous wolves. It also says that Paul was a Benjamite. Hell, Paul was from Benjamin. And yeah. I would mention that to people. <laughs> and Paul was the 13th apostle, if you look in the Bible. Yeah. He wasn't the 12th apostle. And I'd point that out to people. It's After like, Matthias. And, yeah. yeah. And I'd say, you know, I'd, I'd say things like that. But, of course, my bitterness is gone for my family and everything. And, you know, I always worried that if I went to a different church, that they would look at me as a backslider. Because I was taught in a, in a Pentecostal church growing up that people that join different churches are backsliders. And the reprobates. When you're saying re uh, other Christian churches or Mormonism? Or Any, anybody who goes to Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness was a backslider. or anything that's considered a cult is a backslider. Oh, uh, okay, I see. When I went to um, the Protestant churches that I attended, I, I, tr I tried a Church of Christ first in Cedar City, and I really liked them, but they didn't have any music, so I was. No, is this after you came? Yeah, out of Mormonism? Yes. Oh, okay. And I ended up selling, well, I went up going to a church called uh, Sunrise Christian Church. And that in St. George? It's in it? Cedar City. It's in Cedar City, okay. And we settled down there. We love it. Yeah. They're amazing people. Yeah. And I'm actually helping out with the sound and with the cameras right now. Oh, yeah. And my wife's helping out in the nursery, so we've become part of that church family. They accept us with open arms, and our special needs daughters, very much so. We talk a lot about in here at, when people come to Christ, and even though they're busier than ever before, do you feel a freedom and a sense of liberty that you never felt before? Absolutely. I feel very much freedom in Christ right now. Yeah. And it's, it's different. And Cedar City is a pretty small town. Yeah. And, I mean, I remember driving around, and I don't like the way they drive in Cedar City, I'll be honest with you. But sometimes I get angry, and I don't want to <laughs> only two know, main streets, show my right, anger too much yeah. because I worried about what people thought. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to watch R-rated movies because I worried about what a church thought. Mm. And, well, I won't be able to get a temple recommend if I don't live up to these covenants. Now I think, what would Jesus have me do? Yeah. I think more of that, and, 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 and I know he will forgive me if I make a mistake. And I don't need to live up to the perfection that Mormonism teaches. Yeah. I don't have to be perfect because Christ died for me. And he, he fulfilled, and I, I, I shouldn't be a sinner. I mean, I shouldn't live in sin, obviously. Right. I mean, I know a lot of Mormons think that Christians just feel just we can go out and live eat, like drink, hell and, and call married. heaven our own. Yeah. But that's just not the case. Yeah. But I want to do it because of Christ, not because of a church. Well, I was just going to ask you what your perception of Jesus, I see this Jesus is enough, um, from the Adams Road Band, yes. uh, who's been just coming through Salt, or Utah this, this last week. Um, but... It, to kind of share with us what how different Jesus is for you now. Well, before I looked more of, of God as a, not as a friend, as more of a authority figure, yeah. someone who wants to just sit up there and judge you for all your sins. And now I look at God. I could talk to God like I do a friend. Yeah. When I pray to God, I don't need to do these and thous. Because who would you approach your father and say, you know, if my kids did that. I'd be like, what's the matter with you? Don't, don't talk century. to me that way. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So I could talk to God and, you know, be okay with calling him you and, yeah. you know, and it's okay. Have more of a personal relationship rather than titles. And Absolutely. That's one thing I've noticed. Uh, Christians use the word Jesus. We don't, I mean, we use the word Savior, Redeemer, and uh, the Lord and all those things, but from time to time, but that it's not as personal as saying his name, Jesus. Jesus. And Absolutely. Yeah. And I did learn through Adam's Road and other things that Jesus is enough. Yeah. And a grace, did you now come to understand what grace was? And I did. Or had you really had a feel for that? Or are you remembering now what you learned as a, as a young man? I, I do remember what I learned as a young man. But for many years, I kind of adopted the Mormonism way, thinking grace was too easy. Yeah. And that there's more to it than this. But there yeah. really isn't. It's, it's really that simple. And the Bible says it's that simple. Huh. And all you have to do is believe and to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. You don't have to follow any denomination. You don't have to follow any church. You don't have to perform works or ordinances to be saved. It's a free gift. It is. Yeah, I never understood that at all. 
I didn't either. <laughs> and even growing up in it, I still thought, hmm, there's something to this. And it took me a long time to get rid of my bitterness over over some of the people I saw, you know, because some people didn't act like Christians, but you're going to find that everywhere. Yeah. And I don't always act like a Christian either. Yeah, we humans have a way of messing things up, that's for sure. But, well, I'm just really impressed. So, so your wife has uh, been interested, of course, in your journey and what how, how it impacted the family. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. It's been a whirlwind. Um, our kids are still kind of struggling a little bit. They go to church with us for the most part. Our 19-year-old son sometimes attends the singles ward. He goes to Southern Utah University. Hmm. And I want him to be active at the university. And if I let him make up his own mind. Our pastor that's, told us after that's the thing to do, we yeah. got active in the church, he said, at his church, he said, you changed the rules recently. Don't push your kids too hard. Because oh, that's a good point. Well, we raise them in that faith. Yeah. So I can't expect them just up and leave. Yeah. Although some people are encouraging me just to, <laughs> to do just that. Yeah. Our 14 year old son was saved. And we're still waiting on our 16 year old. And our special daughters, we're not too worried about them. I think yeah. God's They're got a hand on them anyway. Yeah. But I'm, I'm hoping that our 19 year old and 16 year old will get saved at some point. But our 16 year old does practice with the worship team sometimes in our, in our church. Oh, really? She and sings? She's got a very great singing voice. Yeah. And I'm hoping that they will encourage her yeah. and to oh. you know, be a good influence on her. Oh, exciting. Well, gosh, believe it or not, there's only a couple of minutes left. Um, I know you've got family on both sides now, I guess, uh, uh, of, of our di discussion, Christians and Mormons. And what would you say to them? They must be thrilled. The Christian side must be thrilled that you've uh, and oh, amazed. And I think their prayers Jesus. for my wife coming to Christ and for softening her heart. And it can't be easy for her because she was raised in the church yeah. from day one. And, and her family's a long line of missionaries and a long history in the church dating back to Joseph Smith. Yeah. John Murdoch and the Doctrine of Covenants is one of the wow. relatives who gave twins to Joseph Smith after his wife passed away. So you're taking a little heat for this bad influence, I guess? They or? haven't said anything to me, but okay. they, they typically they, will more talk to her anyway. <laughs> um, I get along with them pretty good. Well, that's good. They, they're decent people. They're good people. Yeah. And I've you know, grown to care about them over the years. And even even through this, I know they still care about us. Well, that's but, good. Anything you want to say to them or any of, any of your well, I just hope that they will. Friends? I just hope that they will open their hearts and their minds and look at the Bible and do what Michael Wilder suggested to read the Bible like a child, because that's mm -hmm. what I did. And it, it opened my eyes like I couldn't believe. So that's what I suggest to friends and family in the LDS Church. I think that's good counsel. I, I was surprised as I started having these questions that I went in and started reading the, the red words. I found a red letter Bible. Absolutely. Started reading what Jesus said and what he didn't say. Mm -hmm. And same with Paul, what he said and what he didn't say. And it was pretty amazing, eye-opening. Because you're now reading the New Testament, this God-given gift, and uh, reading it with different eyes, really. The eyes were open, and, and, and yours is almost miraculous. I mean, it just seems like it was a moment, uh, you're, you're thinking one way, and the next minute you're thinking another. And that's the way it is to be born again, right? It is. You become a new creation. Yeah. But you still have work to do. I got a lot of work to do. Yeah. And I'm still working on myself every day. Well, good luck with that, and uh, good luck with your pastor aspirations, and Thank you. hope things work out for you. And thanks for coming all the way up from Cedar City. I appreciate you doing that, Alex. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time here on the Ex-Mormon Files.